Okay, I've got to deal with every one of you. We're not going to tell the boss that he had a, that this gentleman had a bigger crowd. <laughs> As the deputy, don't ruin my day, all right? Everybody swear, right? Okay, all right, got it. Okay, good. That's our deal. We never, don't do that. Uh, thank you. And to the veterans in the audience, uh, happy belated Veterans Day. And uh, this event is uh, one of those times where you realize there's a lot of great Americans out there who have contributed a lot to our nation and continue to do it even today. So thank you. Um, I read the bio today. I don't know if many of you did that, but uh, Brian, wow. <laughs> uh, and I'm just going to give you a few highlights. Uh, Brian uh, graduated from East Carolina University in 1970. I remember that year. Uh, unfortunately, I graduated the same year with a degree in history, yay, uh, in anthropology for the next, and then for the next 20 years, served in the United States Air Force as a fighter pilot. And during the Vietnam War, he flew 212 close air support missions and was shot down near the Canadian, uh, Cambodian border. He was unable to eject and forced to ride the plane into the jungle. Wild ride. Uh, severely burned in ensuing crash and he was given up for dead at that particular point. Rescued by special forces, good for the Army, uh, Brian endured one year in a military hospital where he underwent 15 surgical procedures and told he would never fly again. But as uh, human will over doctor's advice, after much physical therapy, Brian miraculously returned to active duty flying, flew the A-7, was an instructor in the A-10, which is still flying today, and went on to teach at the Air Force's Top Gun School. Culminated in Air Force career by flying the nation's top secret spy plane, the SR-71 Blackbird, fastest aircraft ever built, even today. Brian flew covert missions in the Blackbird for four years and was a pilot who provided President Reagan with details photos of the Libyan terrorist camps in 1986. During that time, he became the only SR-71 pilot in history to fly three missions in three consecutive days. And if you know a little bit about what the SR-71 does to your body, since it's flying so fast, that's uh, quite a feat. After retiring from the Air Force in 1990, pursued writing, photography, and was the first pilot to write a book about flying the Blackbird, com completely illustrated with his own photography. He's also the only man to fly extensively with the Navy Blue Angels and the Air Force Thunderbirds as a photojournalist. So I just think going through that, it just serves, serves a life well served and continue to serve. So as a perfect veteran celebration of a speaker that can tell you about what the Air Force had done and what a lot of people have done to serve our nation. So with uh, honor, I'd like to introduce you uh, Air Force hero, Brian. Thank you. Thank you so much. When I was first asked to come here, I envisioned a couple of old men in white lab coats and people. <laughs> it's so nice to see there's humanoids behind the gate. What a treat. Uh, I'm used to working in top secret facilities and also didn't scare me getting in the badge and everything today. But what a pleasure to come and uh, be invited. I know, what, I know what a lot of you are thinking right now. How could a fighter pilot possibly be a keynote speaker? They have a limited vocabulary. <laughs> we talk in words like jet, zoom, fly. Occasionally a larger word like tower, runway. I want you to know that I've been doing this for 25 years now and I've worked extensively on my vocabulary. <laughs> you will be hearing some words in today's presentation that are very, very Big. <laughs> I don't want you to confuse me with anyone that's heroic or famous or did anything great. It's good etiquette when you check the airplane out of the squadron to bring it back. Uh, leaving your jet in the jungle doesn't qualify you as heroic. I am a survivor. Uh, they say a good landing is one you can walk away from. A really great landing is when you can use the airplane again. Uh, I did not do either of those things. I want you to know that what you are looking at here today is the luckiest person 
that you will ever see at this podium, ever. And at the end of today's presentation, I think you will agree with me on that. Now, I will admit to you, I did not feel like the luckiest guy on earth when my aircraft was going down. I couldn't get out. It was, it was a horrendous morning. Everything was going wrong. And I was about to impact the jungle, and I realized I was about to die in a matter of seconds. It was a very sobering thought. I uh, clenched my eyes tightly and clenched my fist. I figured it'll all be over in a heartbeat. I'll wake up in heaven painlessly. It'll be over. Next thing I remember was a great deal of fire and smoke and heat and flames all around me. And I thought, well, maybe I didn't go the way I <laughs> thought I would. <laughs> Quickly realizing I was still alive, I got out of the airplane and collapsed in the jungle. I was severely burned. I was numb. I was not in any great pain. I just, I just realized I couldn't, I couldn't use my hands. They were, I was just really badly burned. And I laid there. And if you want heroes in my story, it is the Special Forces people that came and got me. And they eventually got me back to... It was kind of, a, it's not like in the movies where everybody's anxious to rescue you. Uh, the first chopper said, that's too far, we're out of gas. The next guy said, that's not our sector, we can't be near Cambodia. And finally, the third guy was Army. And, you know, as most of you know, you can talk Army people to just about anything if you try. <laughs> and we got him down there, and uh, he got down there, and I'm listening to all this on the radio. I'm just laying there, and, and they're, they're hovering over me at their weapons, and they're shooting in the background, and they're, they're, they're talking to this guy. And, and he says, I can't put it down. There's not enough rotor clearance. I'll lose my crew. It, this is, uh, and, and I'm thinking, wow, what more could go wrong today? And at that moment, this man that was kind of guarding over me pointed his M16 at the chopper and very clearly on the radio said, you either put it down or we'll shoot it down. <laughs> and I thought at that moment, I am on the right team of players. <laughs> Next thing we heard was, I think we can put it down which he never did, and a superior bit of airmanship. He could not land, he hovered four feet above the ground and they stuffed me in there and it got me back to Thailand and they said, well, he's not gonna make the trip across the Pacific. Send him to Okinawa, send him to Kadena. He'll die, put his body in a box, ship it home. And that's the harsh reality of that war. Well, they shipped a team of nine people from Fort Sam Houston, Texas, burn center, all the way to Okinawa just for me. And their mission in life was see if you could save the young lieutenant. Bad thing happened to me in those two months of intensive care. The numbness wore off. I'd like to tell you all about how courageous, brave, and heroic I was going through all that treatment and tough. It'd be a big fat lie. I'm an inspirational speaker today. I go all over the world and it pains me to tell you that I wanted to give up and that it, it was just so beyond what I could deal with that I, I pray at night, please God, we have the wrong guy. Let me just die and it would be easier. And it's hard for me to even believe I, I did that. And I used to lay there thinking of all the bad things I'd ever done in my entire life. That took a week. <laughs> all right, two weeks. <laughs> and it still didn't add up, and I couldn't cope, and my body was wasting away. I, I was in such incredible shape when I went down. I was in physically fast, 180 pounds of just muscle and steel, at, well, as you see today. And uh, my body went down to 119. 119, and I, it wasn't receiving food. It just, it just said, I, we can't eat. It's just failing. And they said, you know, your body saved you, and now you have to build it back, and you have to get food. And I, I said, it's not, I can't put food down. It's just not working. They said, if you lose another pound, you're, you're, we can't save you. And I, I didn't care at that point. I said, well, okay, then I guess I'm just going to have to die after all this incredible pain for two months. And there has to be a turning point to every story, of course. Mine was kind of a silly thing, except I, it wasn't silly to me. And I will share it with you today. When I was laying there one afternoon, I could see out the third floor window, the soccer field, the end of the runway at Kadena, the, the road there, and I could hear the kids playing soccer every afternoon, laughing and playing and kicking the ball. It was April. And I thought, boy, I was those kids. I'd give anything to be back out there with them. And that made me sad. And at that moment, Judy Garland came on the radio singing Somewhere Over the Rainbow. How many of you know the words to that song? Anybody here? No, you don't. Put your hands down. <laughs> You think you know the words to that song. I thought I did from the Wizard of Oz, Yellow Brick Road. No, no. That is a very deep, philosophical, adult song. You listen to the words to that song. It's all about daring to dream. It's about dreams really coming true. I heard the words of that song for the first time that day. They penetrated my brain sharper than any scalpel they were using. And I could look out the window and see the other side of the rainbow and those kids. And I made a choice, I made a decision right then. I am going to try to eat the food tomorrow. 
I want to live. I'm going to try to survive. I'll never fly again. I'll never do anything. I'll probably lose a couple fingers and I probably won't walk right again. It doesn't matter. I am going to change my attitude and, then, and tomorrow I'm going to start trying to, to heal. And isn't it amazing how the simplest change of attitude in life can affect the whole rest of your life? That one choice. The next day they came in, they had the food, they could see a different look on my face, they could see fire in my eyes, which is probably a bad pun at this point. <laughs> and they were excited, and I tried to eat, and it wouldn't go down. My body rejected it, and I could not eat. They were beside themselves. They could see I was trying, and I'm saying, no, God, please, just forget everything I just said up for two months. I'm, I want to eat now. Let it go down. Nothing. Finally, some army corpsman had a sack lunch. His wife had packed him. He said, this, is, this didn't come from the hospital, but it's different. Maybe there's something in here he could eat, anything. It was nothing except a little plastic container of cherry Kool-Aid. And the cherry Kool-Aid went down real good. They ran to the commissary and got every pack of cherry Kool-Aid they could find. I drank 3.2 gallons of cherry Kool-Aid the first day. Ladies and gentlemen, I lived on cherry Kool-Aid for four straight days, drinking an average of five gallons a day. And I peed real good. And they said, that's even a better sign. His body's functioning normally internally. He doesn't need anything internally. He's just got to build his body back. Eventually, some saltine crackers, some bread. Next thing you know, I'm on a plane back to the States. Where I spent a whole year in the hospital. And they did all kinds of surgery. And they said, well, I guess we won't cut those fingers off. Maybe we could save them. You'll never fly again, though. Keep that in mind. You'd be lucky to just be alive. Well, back then, the deep uh, recesses of my brain, I needed to think I could still fly again to go through all the therapy. I had to have a goal. I, I realized the power in the mind was far greater than the failing muscles of your body. Spent a year there, and one day, I'm not going to bore you with that whole tale of adventure, make you sick. Boom, I pop out of the hospital, and more miraculously, I'd passed a flight physical. They couldn't flunk me. They said, internally, he's strong as nails. He just, he looks like hell on the outside, but <laughs> the scar tissue, if he keeps working it, he, he, he's got dexterity, I, we can't flunk him. I got out of the hospital, I went back to the Air Force. The Air Force wasn't all that excited to have me. They're going like, well, you, you crashed one of our jets already. You know, they, <laughs> they didn't say that. They didn't know what to do with me. And here's something you've already learned in life, I'm sure. There are many no people in the world who want to explain to you why you can't do something. Many people who are too afraid to do their life. Fear rules all their decisions. I don't want to look bad. I'm probably not very good at it. I might fail. People might laugh at me. All the reasons that stop people from living their dream. I didn't have that problem. You lay on your back for a year, you will learn what's important in life. And you will have no fear because you're not going to miss another moment of it. So when I returned, I had two major concepts in my brain that I will share with you today. One, life is short and it's uncertain. It's not one or the other, it's both. And because it is, you can't possibly miss the gift that each day is. Number two, pursue your passion now. Do it now. Do the thing in life you love, whether it's family, work, job, hobby, whatever it is, don't wait because of rule number one. Armed with this very simplistic bit of knowledge, I went back in the Air Force and I felt like I was a two-year-old. I was born again. I was like starting over. I'd had a whole year in the hospital and it was like I was fearless and I wasn't going to miss anything, and I was like, two. Now, it makes the Air Force very nervous to have two-year-olds flying their, their jets. <laughs> they either loved me or hated me. I was an enigma. It was like, this is the greatest guy we had in the squad, and he'll try anything, he'll volunteer, he's fearless, and he, he's got a great attitude. Or he is a loose cannon. We don't know what he's going to do next. I got back to flying, and... I, I became a big story in the Air Force, which I didn't want. I, fame and, and being in a magazine, it wasn't, that wasn't comfortable. People then all thought, well, they knew you, and they, they're all looking at you funny and like, well, so what does the scar tissue feel? You know, it's like, I just want to do my job. And I did my job very well. And I, I was teaching at Top Gun, and one day I, I said, I'd like to fly the world's fastest jet, SR-71. It's the only thing left I haven't done, and, I, and then I can retire. And they said, whoa, all the no people came running out of the woodwork. You have to take an astronaut physical to fly that airplane because you're flying at 90,000 feet. That means if you flunk any part of that very difficult two-day physical, 
you will never fly again, and that's why people are afraid to go try out for that program. There's that word afraid. Well, I was 12. I was a 12-year-old by the time I got to this program. <laughs> Have you ever known a 12-year-old was when you said, hey, maybe you shouldn't do that skateboard on the coast? I'd said, yeah, boy, that's pretty dangerous. I don't think it will. They're already doing it. <laughs> I said, but what if I passed the physical and could actually fly? that airplane, we would have missed it. And again, being surrounded by adults, I, they didn't get it. I scored the sixth highest score at Travis on their astronaut physical they had ever had. I was motivated. And internally, my body really was very strong. And they said, wow, you, you, you look like hell on the outside, but you're still strong. It's like, you, and then they were worried about scar tissue. And let me just tell you about scar tissue. It's, it's like leather. It's OK. It just You stretch it. It's actually tougher than skin. It's actually fine to fly with. You have to keep stretching and everything. So the Air Force was like so afraid. Then they said, well, you're wearing a space suit when you fly. And good God, we got to be breathing 100% oxygen all the time. And, and that could, you know, mess up your scar tissue. Yeah, they just didn't get it. <laughs> and I said, uh, I went into surgery 15 times, and they were giving me 100% oxygen every time. So I pretty much think it'll be OK. What I learned in life as a 12-year-old in an adult world was that we become fearful. We become, we, we lose our dream. We lose our passion. I was exactly the opposite. It didn't please everyone around me. And those that it did, you know, love you for life and say, thank you for reminding me what a gift each day is that isn't guaranteed. For those of you that are not familiar, this aircraft, the SR-71, stood for strategic reconnaissance, went globally. This was the airplane in, that was invented because Gary Powers was shot down in 1960 over Russia. President Eisenhower was quite embarrassed. Went to Ke Kelly Johnson at Lockheed, said, build me an airplane they cannot shoot down. 18 months later, they rolled out the Blackbird, the SR-71, the fastest, highest flying jet ever built. We are cruising at 2,000 miles an hour. Uh, at 90,000 feet. And I could read your name tag if you were standing outside flying over at that speed. This airplane carried a crew of two, a pilot and a navigator, carried 80,000 pounds of fuel, about 16,000 gallons. We'd burn through in an hour and a half. It was made of titanium. You can't forge titanium. You can't use regular tools on titanium. That's why no one's ever built an airplane out of titanium, because it's too difficult and impossible to do. And they had a dream, and they did it. He said, we're going to invent technology in 1962. We're going to invent technology without computers to build an airplane. And they hand-built each one. They only built 50 of these forever. And only about 35 were made the reconnaissance version. This airplane was your guardian of freedom of this nation for 26 years. It did more to shape your foreign policy from the Vietnam War to the Gulf War. It served six different presidents and did so many things behind the scenes that you never, all those pictures of Haiphong Harbor during the Huntley-Brinkley reports back in the 60s were shot, uh, pictures taken by this aircraft. There were no weapons on this airplane. Your only weapon was speed. In 26 years, not one was ever shot down. Not one piece of one jet was ever hit by any missile. Well ahead of its time, this was the jet that gave way to no other plane. Just up the road here in Marysville at Beale Air Force Base was the home of the most remarkable aircraft of the 20th century. People didn't know a lot about it because it was so top secret uh, that you, you couldn't say a lot about it. Uh, only, only later when it started setting speed records in the 70s just to thumb the, the nose at the, at the Soviets, people became more aware of it. And uh, today, uh, people are still mesmerized by the fact that we could build an airplane in the 60s that as you're sitting here today in 2016 still holds every speed and altitude record. Well, I was crewed with Major Walter Watson. He's the one on the left. <laughs> it was bad enough that I was getting all this uh, publicity in the Air Force as that burned up guy that's now flying the, the SR. Well, now Walter was the first and only African-American officer ever to be in this program. And what a brilliant engineer he was. 
What a terrific guy. We are best friends to this day. We flew for four years, every mission together. They team you up because the airplane requires that you work in tandem. You learn to work together in two totally different cockpits. Uh, we are, like say, best friends to this day, and I had the best backseater in the squadron. When I got in the airplane, I checked out my cockpit. It looks pretty, pretty normal, pretty ancient here. You know what kind of uh, radar we had? We didn't have any radar. You know what kind of computers? That we, we didn't have any computers. You know what kind of flaps, spoilers, speed brake? We didn't have any of those things. The airplane was your basic street rod, 60s, go fast, burn gas airplane. And I loved it. Now, I got a little nervous. I saw no guns, bombs, or rocket switches. Felt a little naked. I thought, well, maybe I can flip a camera switch on. And it, Nope. Walter had all the camera sensors, all the secret stuff in the back seat. I said, Walt, if we're ever shot down, you're the spy. I'm just the driver. <laughs> Now, getting used to the space helmet did take a little, because as a fighter pilot in flight, you can take your oxygen mask off, uh, wipe sweat out of your eye, or if you're a Navy pilot, pick your nose, or whatever it is they, <laughs> whatever it is they do. Um, but now, you were entombed for five hours, six hours, whatever the mission was, they'd breathe in 100% oxygen, and, and you'd get a little ear, earache later in the night when you came home. But, but you got thirsty, dehydrated, hungry, no big deal. I was a new guy, and they were kind of playing with me on my first big mission. They said, hey, have the ham and cheese omelet at the in-flight. Don't do the steak and eggs today. Do the ham and cheese omelet and put extra cheese on there because, you know, you're going to need that protein for that man. I thought, well, that makes sense. Cheese, protein, sure, pile it on. Now, those of you that know, as you go higher in elevation, the evolved gases in your body expand. <clears throat> well, Passing 55,000 feet in the climb that day, I thought I was going to give live birth in the cockpit. <laughs> Walter's going, are you okay? Which I'm making sounds he's never heard. And uh, finally at 72,000 feet, when relief came, I very tearfully realized how self-contained that entire uh, <laughs> environmental system was. Now, they worried about, I had two, I had a, a, a steel pin put in my finger here, but they built the hinge joint in. Had they not built the hinge joint into it, but on a whim, the doctor just said, well, why don't we just do that? He might want it someday. He's never going to fly again. Had they not done that, I would have never passed the physical. But because I could grip and grasp, which is what the reg said, but I had to learn to do some things upside down backwards in the cockpit. And you know, you will learn how to do something if you're motivated. I had the power of motivation and will on my side. You could learn as a 12-year-old, you could, you could do it if you want to do it bad enough. Now, I'll admit it's a lot more fun being in the front seat. Uh, you got a stick, you have a view. Walter had no way to fly the plane in the back. He's got his head down, working on the magic stuff. So here we are getting ready to go on a real mission. If you look closely at my spacesuit, ah, it's a little happy face. Kind of, yeah, this is fun. Walter's, ah, not so much. <laughs> Now, it may surprise you to know how few people we had in the squadron at any one time. We only had 15 guys in the squadron at any one time. We're out of the country six months out of the year, and we only flew out of three locations and covered the globe all the time. Two jets in Okinawa, two jets in England, 10, 11 airplanes at Beale. That's it. That was it. Only 93 men in history flew this jet. And I always said I appreciated it more than the other 92. The photographs that you're seeing in today's presentation represent the world's rarest collection of Blackbird photos anywhere, because they're all my own pictures. Now, you weren't allowed to carry a camera in certain areas. You couldn't do it, blah, 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 blah. But if you really wanted to get a photograph, you could get permission from the commander, go to the security chief, get the wing commander to sign off. It was a big hassle, but it could be done. And photography was my passion when I came out of the hospital. And what I say about living your dream, following your dream, don't miss the moment. So here I was with the most elegant aircraft ever built and carrying my camera out when I could. How was I going to miss that? In seven years, I only got 200 pictures. That's not a lot. That's not a lot. But that was the passion. Did I know I was going to be a speaker, write a book? Of course not. I just thought, how could you miss the moment of what this is? This is Okinawa Kadena. We're getting ready to go up to North Korea. Sonic boom their little shorts off. Um, <laughs> This airplane carried a double sonic boom at 2,000. Let me just give you a speed reference here. If you went hunting with your, your .30-06 rifle, that bullet exits the muzzle at 3,100 feet per second. 
This airplane would cruise with ease in a climb at 3,200 feet per second. Okay? We're doing a mile every two seconds. Or a mile every second and a half if you want to go a little faster. The jet would always go a little faster. Ronald Reagan knew how to use this airplane. He was our commander in chief. One day, the, uh, the, uh, all the bad guys were having a conference up in North Korea. They invited all the Soviets and the Chinese, the Vietnamese, all the bad guys were there. And they didn't invite us. <laughs> Ronald Reagan said, hey, have Brian and Walter take off out of Kadena, go up to Korea and fly a little figure eight. But, and we're, so we did this mission. We got and we said, what are we doing? We're, we have photographed the entire country in the first six minutes. It was Ronald Reagan's way of every six minutes, sonic booming their coffee cup off the table. <laughs> just to let them know, we know you're there, and now you know we're here, and you can't do a thing about it. Over 4,500 missiles were fired at this jet in 25 years. Not one was ever hit. Little footnote to history here, you may not know. Behind the jet is the Kadena Marina, where the Navy has a little officer's club where people are windsurfing and sailing and psh, learning how to windsurf and rumor has it and I, I don't know how true this is but some SR-71 pilots on takeoff would like suck the wheels up 10 feet off the deck and full burner go ripping across that marina knocking <coughs> windsurfers over and I think that's just a rumor personal. <laughs> <coughs> now I want you to be impressed with these pictures today but I don't want you to be impressed with the photographer because the photographer knew nothing about photography except that he loved it and he had his Kodachrome slide film and had his little manual F3 camera and he was around the most beautiful lady in black that you would ever want to photograph. So it was a passion and it showed me. Now when I look at this picture, that's a beautiful picture. That's a gloomy sky in England, getting ready to take off. The jet's running up one engine at a time. We're in the mobile car down the runway, mesmerized by the sound and fury that's going on in before us. Me and the commander are sitting in the mobile car, and he looks over, and he says, what's that camera doing on the seat? You know you're not supposed to have a camera out here. And then he looks back at the jet, because it just it captures our attention. And I'm like, huh, what, camera? And then I had to think fast. I go, you know, Colonel, if I got a picture of that, you could put that in your office while well, nobody would have that picture. <laughs> and as if not to be complicit, he never looked at me. He stared straight ahead at the jet, and I saw the little vein come out on his forehead. And his lips never moved exactly. But somehow I heard, you have 10 seconds. I will never forget this, because this, this, every time I see this picture, I can still feel the steel uh, buckle on the runway there where I'd put my knee in the hardness of the concrete and the cold of that, that, that England air, and I got two shots in 10 seconds, and I was still fumbling with my zoom lens, and I still couldn't figure out what the word aperture on the camera meant. I had no idea, and I'm trying to roll it, and I'm thinking, what, it, it, did I expose it correctly? Did I get the wingtips in? I see that picture today and people go, ah, oh, it's National Geographic, man, that's beautiful. Yeah, it's beautiful because somebody didn't miss the moment, was not afraid to fail. Somebody just went for it because they were 12 and they didn't care if they failed, they weren't going to miss it. Because when they were laying on their back in the hospital, they were missing everything. They had given their left toe to get out there and fail at something. I love that picture. Uh, moments later, the jet took off and did a big six-hour mission around the Russia and the Arctic Circle. If you never heard one of these take off, your life's incomplete, I'm sorry. Uh, this was not a sound you heard as much as felt. I got one shot of the takeoff remotely in focus, uh, and every, bo every bone in my body was vibrating as it went by. Climbing out over Susanville, uh, we're in a chase aircraft here, a little T-38. I don't want to make any Cessna drivers here feel bad today if there are any people fly. From brake release to 26,000 feet, leveling at 450 knots is 3 minutes and 51 seconds. I think that's about three days in a Cessna. I'm not sure. <laughs> now, if you're going to go this fast all over the world, you're going to need aerial refueling two to five times on any mission. Pretty, pretty nice on a clear, calm day like this, sunny day. No, no big deal. We're all very highly experienced guys. We're really good at what we do. We're like all stars. You try this at night in the weather in a turn, in turbulence, with lightning in your face, they don't pay you enough. But you have to get the fuel. I still have nightmares at night, not about the war, not about being shut down, 
Not about anything except night refueling. It was not a comfortable thing. On my days off, I'd go up with the boom operator, and they say, what in the world are you doing on your day off going up to fly on the tanker for like five or six hours, and you're only going to get like 30 seconds of actually, and I go, we're the only people in the world get to do this. Why, why would I not? I, I got my camera. I got a new roll of Kodachrome, and I, I'm pretty sure I figured out that aperture thing today, you know? <laughs> and they just look at me like, hey, it's your, go on. The tanker guys loved having you. This was the Achilles heel of the program. People say, how could they cancel it because of budget? A lot of tanker support for every mission for 25 years, dedicated, because they had to carry the special fuel that only we used. Here's a picture you'll never see because aerobatics over a refueling operation are pretty much illegal. <laughs> but God, what a shot. Come on. <clears throat> No, come on, I, I don't want to give you the impression I was completely out of control. The Air Force photographer came out one year and said, we've only photographed this jet once or twice in, in the whole lifetime. I need someone to fly me in the T-38, go up there, and I knocked over three people and said, I, I will fly the photo chase. When we were done, he said, that was the most exciting photo chase I have ever done in my 20 years as the official photographer, and we got the best, but yeah, we got that shot, folks. You know, another one of those pictures you'd say, well, there, you must have known what you're doing, Rembrandt lighting. No, no. Sitting at Kadena one day, the same commander who now had a beautiful picture in his <laughs> office said, Brian, on your day off, why don't you go up on the tanker, see if you can get some more cool pictures. I go, well, thanks, sir. I think I will. Went up on the tanker, and they're just climbing out of Kadena over the South China Sea, and the, the cloud deck reflected light, and they banked 12 degrees, and the early morning sun gave it a black shine, you could see the fuel seeping out across the wing. This airplane grew four inches in flight due to the 900 degree Fahrenheit heat that built up in it. So we had to build expansion joints into the aircraft so it leaked and oozed when it was subsonic. And this is one of the rare shots where you actually get to see the fuel seeping out across the wing. And again, everyone says, wow, professional photography. Flailing with that zoom lens. In order to take a picture in the boom pod, you have to lean over because the boomer has center, center caught. And you got to lean over. Can't look through your viewfinder very well. This was pre-digital days, folks. No auto anything. And I thought, well, I didn't get much today. What a waste. Probably one of my favorite uh, pictures. And the, the real issue here is not, ooh, look at my photography. Don't miss the moment. Coming off the tanker, passing 50,000 foot in the climb. The sky turns a very deep, dark, cobalt blue, and you're above all that weather that you feared when you flew mortal planes. Leveling at 85,000 feet, you look out the window, it just takes your breath away, and you realize you're not in a rocket ship, but you feel like you are. You're in an air-breathing jet above 90% of the Earth's atmosphere. You are ripping along at speeds that are Mach 3, three times the speed of sound, uh, or more, and it always would go more. This is what the Arctic Circle looks like at about 90,000 feet. And you might think, well, who are we spying on at the Arctic Circle? You know, Santa is a sled driver. He's OK. <laughs> we used to call the plane the sled as a nickname. Um, one day, the Soviets put a bunch of new missiles around the Arctic Circle in, in, in the Soviet Union. They, they, we didn't know what these missiles' capabilities were. And some general said, Brian, Walt, come in with a secret briefing. Um, we need you to fly up there, point your jet at their border. Make them think you're going to penetrate their airspace. Those missile sites will come up. Walter, you record all that data electronically. At the last minute, turn, come back. We'll, we'll learn what those missiles can do. <laughs> I just have one question, General, sir. Uh, what if they don't know we're not going to penetrate their airspace and they fire one of these, we don't know what they'll do, missiles at us? He said, well, that's even better. We'll get launch data. <laughs> this is the confidence they had in this airplane. It was so great. Walter and I actually did this mission. I saw two sunrises and two sunsets that day, because in the winter, you take off out of England, you get to the North Pole, it's night with stars. And you come back, you see the sun kind of come up again. Anyway, no one shot at us. We came back with all this data. Four years later, every Navy and Air Force fighter pilot was armed with electronic countermeasures to these missiles, which were by then widespread throughout the Middle East. So we did a lot of variety of missions. We found a hiker on Mount McKinley nobody could find. We found a guy in the Pacific Ocean in a boat tried to sail around the world. He got stuck, nobody could find him. We found him. Uh, we did a lot of cool 
uh, missions that weren't always just spying on the Soviets. But that was the primary, Cuba, Korea, China, Vietnam, Soviet Union, uh, Nicaragua, you name it. If it was in the newspaper, this airplane was probably involved. And if you saw pictures, uh, they weren't all satellite pictures. <laughs> One day I was looking in the rearview mirror and I saw this incredible reflection in my green visor. Now, don't ask me why we had rearview mirrors in the world's fastest jet. Uh, <laughs> I can assure you no one was gaining on us, but I've already admitted to you as a big baby in the hospital, I'll admit something else today. I, I used to look in the mirror and pull my visor up and to see the scar tissue on my face and say, you are not dreaming this, you are actually doing it. In the hospital, they'd give you these drugs for pain that would take you on these wild, like LSD type dreams where you didn't know reality from uh, dream world. You just couldn't, you'd wake up and go, oh God, I'm in a hospital, it must be a dream, I can't possibly be this badly injured. And then you'd realize that was your reality. So I, I would actually, I didn't tell Walter, it might worry him a little psychologically, the man is still looking at himself in the mirror. Uh, but I would actually do that to make sure you are, just 12 years ago, you're laying in hospital, you are, you're doing it right now. Well, I put the camera up there on timer, 10 seconds, and uh, you may think we had a lot of time to take pictures and fly. I have six cockpit shots in, in seven years. Um, and those mostly are on training missions. Almost all of them are training. You, you didn't have a lot of time. I don't want to give the impression that, you know, we, we could be fooling around or playing in there. But I uh, love this picture. It actually uh, it shows a little bit of the, the cockpit. And people always are asking me, what are your favorite missions? And I could talk for 30 more minutes on just that. One was this mission where we're coming across the coast of Vietnam going to look at China and Cambodia, and we fly right over the same place where B. Shul was shot down 12 years earlier. Don't think we didn't lay down some serious sonic boom that day <laughs> and blow down some trees 18 miles high. Walter had to tell me, pull it back, pull it back, let's not, uh, you got to realize your turn radius at that speed is about three states, so you don't want to be sliding into red China there at the last minute. And I will tell you, it's pretty cool, it's pretty cool being the fastest guys on the block. You know, you walk in the officer's club on a Friday night and all the F-15, F-16 guys are talking, all the toy jet fighter guys. And, uh, <laughs> and they were all my ex-students, so I, I used to fly those planes. And my instructor and I walked into the bar one time and uh, we've got the, the M3 Plus patch. And we're the only guys in the, in the world that can wear Mach 3 Plus. And it's a cool thing. So we just, and my instructor was very cool. So they're going like, yeah, we did all this today. Now they look at, so what'd you guys do today? Because see, if you, don't have, if you don't have guns, bombs, or rockets, you're like spit, you know, you're just. So he goes, well, we did Nebraska in four and a half minutes today. Whew, kind of shut everybody up. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that's the best way to do Nebraska, by the way. <laughs> in case you've ever driven through there. <laughs> Sometimes the jet would reward me with an incredible view I didn't expect. We took a jet from Sacramento to London, which was a three and a half hour flight. Ripped across Canada at night, saw the stars in Milky Way. I write three pages of my book alone on what that looked like. I could never get that picture. What an incredible sight. And we saw the sun come up over Iceland. And I just happened to have my little tiny camera in my spacesuit uh, pocket there on a little lanyard. Coming back in to land by Mount Lassen, again, we're in a chase aircraft. I was a T-38 instructor, so I got to fly uh, the T-38 during the week a lot. So it afforded me the opportunity, and this was not illegal at all. You could take all the photos you wanted, and guys were always saying, oh, you're carrying the camera again, don't you have enough pictures? And I'd go, have you eaten enough ice cream in your life? Are you never going to have another ice cream? I wanted to take pictures every day if I could, but you, you couldn't. It was very, uh, very difficult to do. Sometimes the last 10 minutes of flight were the most harrowing. You're up in a clear air mass for five, six hours. Guess what? The weather's all changed when you come back. You're landing in, in England sometimes on an icy, foggy, zero, zero visibility runway after six hours of gut-wrenching air refueling. You're dehydrated, hungry, and you have enough gas for one approach. And you're at 190 knots across the fence. Don't mess it up. And I will tell you, you learn how to concentrate mightily in those last 10 minutes of flight because you got one shot of getting that airplane down. And the rule was, we can train uh, other pilots. You're expendable. Don't hurt the jet. And uh, <laughs> that was the only uh, regulation I ever read in a, an actual flight manual that said that. Go down. You, you, if you die, that's okay, but don't hurt the jet. Now, if you want more than your 15 minutes of fame in life, 
You be an SR-71 pilot. Go to a major air show where there's 100,000 people. Fly your jet over their heads. Light the burners in their face. Land at their air show. Stand in front of the jet. You are a sky god. <laughs> and I will tell you, I never felt prouder in my entire Air Force career than to stand out in front of this plane. It was the hero and all-star of any air show you brought it to. And, and I flew it in the 80s when it was well known and it was okay. And we did a lot of air shows from Paris Air Show. I got to open the Reno Air Races one year and I think I pretty much won my heat. Um, <laughs> This is the Big England show. They had 200,000 people there, and I swear 199,000 of them were at that jet. And you'd hear funny questions like, people, they were in awe of the airplane. It was like meeting the Pope. They'd stand and stare speechless. Then they'd stare at you. They couldn't speak. We're going, hey, we're just regular Air Force pilots. We're not astronauts. We're not, you know, and they just couldn't speak. Finally, when they did, they'd say something like, when you go into orbit, do you shut the engines down? And we go, no, no, we don't go into orbit. It's not a rocket. That's what's so amazing is that it's an air-breathing jet. That's why it's, it's a remarkable thing. But after you heard that question enough times, you'd have to play with them a little bit. And one day uh, I heard that question, and I said, well, if you promise not to tell anyone, I, I will share some very classified information. But you have to keep this. Very, and Walter's rolling his eyes. Oh, God, here we go. They wanted to be a part. People love undefeated first in class. And they wanted so bad to be a part of it. So I said, okay, here's the deal. When we're on the backside of the moon, <laughs> and his eyes got real big. And I said, we shut one engine down to preserve fuel, and we used the gravitational force to sling us back into him. He was so, his mouth's open. He's like, and I said, but, but don't, don't tell anybody because that's critical. I, no, 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 I won't tell anybody. Went well, running back to his family, told him everything, and it was like, <laughs> But it was a, a real proud thing to stand in front of this airplane at the Paris Air Show. The Soviets would come over and stare at it, and we thought, yeah, pal, that's the closest you will ever get to one. Uh, we used to see the, so the Soviet MiGs coming up chasing us over the Baltic there, and they'd be frozen, their contrails would be frozen in that Arctic sky to see these big white plumes, and all of a sudden they'd get all puffy and squiggly, and they'd be out of gas and ideas, and they'd be falling out of the sky, and they better get back home, or they're never going to make it. I got four inches of throttle left in my 57 Chevy, and I'm, I'm blowing the doors off a, a 1988 MiG. That just gave you such a sense of American technology. You folks work on, on cutting edge technology and, and you, you kind of know what I'm talking about. There's, there's no other country in the world where we can do what we put our minds to it. It's like the stuff that, this was 60s stuff. Unbelievable. Baby Jet the T-38 was uh, your companion trainer. You kept current in uh, formation and instruments over Lake Tahoe. Camera boy could not ex uh, resist the beautiful little white jet. Uh, that white jet afforded me the opportunity to get many of the photographs you see today. And, and I, I, it was totally legal and everybody said, okay, nobody else wanted to do it. And again, I didn't know that I'd be the one man keeping the memory of this jet alive for the next 30 years. Uh, I just thought I'll have a nice collection of photographs once I figure out how to use that dang lens. Um, but a beautiful jet. Walter and I would go up and do little training sorties. He had a stick now, a real view. Nobody was shooting at us. Uh, I said I wasn't uh, famous or anything. Walter and I do have one claim to fame. Uh, we are famous set, and that is that we flew three missions in three days uh, during the uh, Libya crisis. In 86, we're the guys that provided Reagan with all the photos. They did fire two missiles at us on that one mission. And that did caught our attention. And uh, we went to full throttle, and people always go, how fast will that jet go? Let me tell you, faster than the book says it will. <laughs> the real reason we had the baby jet was for uh, chase uh, assistance. Here the SR is dumping fuel immediately after takeoff, has an emergency, has to lighten his gross weight so he can land. Uh, 38's going to offer uh, safety assist. We just happened to be airborne that day, and somebody just happened to have their camera with them got a very rare shot of the two of them together right over Beale Air Force Base. This is the only picture I'll brag about today and tell you I knew what I was doing. This was after my 20th year in the Air Force. I had two weeks to go, and I got, bought a cable release for my little F3, a Nikon there, put it up, and uh, got my buddy to fly way too close. And I had finally figured out what the word aperture meant. <laughs> I'm in focus. He's in focus. Mammoth Lakes is in focus. Loved that shot. Some company in New York loved it too and said, we'd like to build a puzzle of this. Uh, we understand you'll be getting out of the Air Force soon. We'd like to pay you some royalties. And all of a sudden, 
Doors were being opened to the one guy that had been carrying a camera around who did not want to fly for American Airlines, had no interest in flying for the air airlines. Last I checked, they didn't do barrel rolls or fly through the Grand Canyon in their A-10. <laughs> there were no loops involved. I wanted to do, pursue my photo writing, photography, and that led instantly in 1990 to those things the same year that they retired the jet. 1990, they started flying jets off the base to museums. They said the budget, we're, we're going to put the money to satellites and drones. We can't keep doing all that tanker support. The Cold War's over. We can do without it. Big mistake. They wish they hadn't. They at least it should have flown another 10 years. But there came a sad day when the very last airplane at Beale took off and we realized this was the end of an era. You were never going to see the likes of this kind of airplane again. I would have taken more pictures that day, but tears welled up in my eyes as I realized this was the last of, of a legend. Every Soviet MiG fighter pilot knew that profile right there, wanted to be first to shoot one down. Viktor Belenko defected to this country with his MiG-25, gave it to him. He says, we built a whole line of MiGs for one purpose, shoot that damn airplane down. He says, we could not understand how your decadent capitalist Mickey Mouse society could build an airplane in the 60s that we could not shoot down in the 90s. And the general got right in his face, kind of like a baseball umpire, and he said, Victor, that's what you can do in a country where men are free. Man, Victor Blanco got it. Became an American citizen, lived in America, and said, what would you like to see now that you live in the United States? He said, only two things, Disneyland and an SR-71 up close. <laughs> the rumor is he enjoyed the latter more. Leaving Air Force history through the gates of legend, the airplane sits quietly, if not proudly, in 30 locations today. Only one overseas in Duxford, England. The other 29, if you haven't seen one, uh, they're all around. They're not that hard to find. California has a lot of them. Uh, there's definitely, it's worth seeing a piece of, of American aviation technology that has uns been unsurpassed. These people literally invented technology to build an airplane out of titanium that did its job better than any, anything else. I was, I was left with all these wonderful photographs, and I wanted to do something with them when I got out of the Air Force, and, I, and all the no people said, you're not a writer, you're not a publisher, you're not a photographer, you don't know what you're doing, you're just an ex-fighter pilot. And I thought, well, yeah, but I have a collection of stuff, I'd like to do something to honor the jet. So me and, uh, everyone turned me down. Me and a couple guys got together, we took out a big loan, ate peanut butter sandwiches for two years, and, we did a book called Sled Driver. Little did we know when we did that first edition, we thought two or three hundred people would, would buy it and everything. Well, then the internet got big. And then people said, wow, we've never had a pilot that wrote, flew this jet write a book. And we love it and we want more. And then we redid the book, made it nicer. And now it is the single most popular book worldwide. It's in 48 countries. You go on the internet tonight, look up Sled Driver. It's $400, $500. We print a limited number each year. You can't hardly get them. They're like icon, icons to the aviation world. Well, I brought a very limited number as a special treat for you guys here today. We're selling at 235 which is way below any price you will ever see outside of here. Um, we are supporting Wounded Warrior today. Uh, it's a little bit after Vets Day, but we support them year-round. I also uh, want you to know that we've just commemorated the 50th anniversary of the first flight of the jet recently. And we're the only guys that did a gold coin. Lockheed, nobody, no one thought to do a gold coin. How quickly we forget our history. We are the only ones that did a coin. We minted 3,000 of them for Mach 3. I have 150 left. I brought a couple dozen coins. Like They're actually $50 gold pieces. They're worth about 62 bucks for the gold that's in them. Uh, we sell them for 50. Uh, if you're looking for a little early Christmas gift, uh, Santa is a sled driver. Uh, <laughs> So they're all uh, pre-approved. Also, I want you to know that if you do buy one of my books today, that I'll be happy to sign. There are still some photographs that are extremely classified, and I hope you don't divulge to anyone outside of this audience. <laughs> I'm hoping that you will keep these things to yourself. I'll always be the sled driver guy, no matter what else I do in life. I went on to do a lot of other different things. When I got out of the Air Force, I uh, flew with the Thunderbirds for their winter training season to do a book on them. They said uh, no one has ever been allowed to fly with them during winter training season. And I recommend you don't. They're not real good yet. They're still learning how to do their uh, thing. But it uh, led me to my infamous year with the Blue Angels. No one in history got to spend a whole year uh, air show season in the back seat with the blues, but I did. 
Was I the best photographer in America? Was I the best photojournalist? Was I the most one? No. I was the guy that called 437 times on the phone. And they said no every time. And I drove my truck to El Centro, California, godforsaken lettuce field on the Mexico-California border. <laughs> but I knew that's where the Blue Angels do winter training. And I showed up. And the guy said, you're the first guy that ever showed up. We get 100 calls a day for people who want to fly. Sports heroes, senators, congressmen, movie stars. They never show up. And they never give anything back. You want to do a book for us? I said, yeah. Whole year, 80,000 slides. Put the best 200 in a book. Wish I could show you that book. It's beautiful. We, we sold out of it. I'm, we're going to reprint it. There's three jets in this picture. How often do you think those three jets are lined up that well? How often do you think our jet is lined up with those three that well? <laughs> Pretty much never. Now, we were almost killed here. That's not a wide-angle fisheye lens. That is a normal 55-millimeter lens where number two moved out too quick. We moved up. We, we were counting rivets. We almost died right there. And my pilot got a little nervous. He said, whoa, partner, don't put that in the book. I was like, we almost killed ourselves. Now, Dino, I flew with Dino quite a bit. He's flying for FedEx now. And he was pretty cool. The first time I flew it, he goes, Air Force boy. That's what they called me for the first six months, Air Force boy. <laughs> Your seat is four inches higher in the back, so I'll know when you start crying and squealing like a little girl that I'm too close, and I'll back it off a little bit for you. I go, well, that's so good to know. Um, <laughs> but this day, we almost, we almost hit, and we are taxiing in. I said, hey, Dino, I used to teach this stuff for a living, and I was really good, but you scared me bad twice today. He goes, that's okay, partner. I scared myself three times. <laughs> I did my very last flying uh, with the Air National Guard. I did a photo uh, calendar shoot for the Portland Air National Guard over Mount Hood, the uh, F-15 Eagles. We call this Eagles in the Hood. Uh, and I hung up my spurs. And people go, how could you, st how could you stop flying? I had 5,000 hours of pure joy. I, my back was hurting. I, I was older. I wanted to do other chapters in life. And people go, how? I, and the reason I could walk away when so many of my friends who went to the airlines still regret is because I did it fully. I didn't leave any of it on the field, as they say. It's like I did it all. I almost killed myself about 100 times in the A-10, A-7, F-5, doing all the stuff that we do in daily work that you don't even realize goes on every day. And I was okay to walk away because I, I wanted to pursue my nature of photography. I wanted to go walk across the land I'd been flying across so fast that, that I didn't get to really see it. And as a pilot, what I found out was I was totally enamored with nature's flyers, nature's pure pilots. If you a simple seagull, you just ignore it. When you really look at it, it has the most perfect elliptical wing that we, gives it such speed and maneuverability. A bald eagle that you can't take your eyes off when you see one in the wild, especially up close. And you watch them for hours and hours and hours. And uh, a, a bird so fierce, it became the symbol of the greatest nation on earth. Even the tiniest delicate flyer can manage to navigate its way from Canada to Mexico every year. We still haven't figured out how it quite does that with a navigational system far superior than anything man has ever made. And I defy any aerodynamics engineer to diagram all the aerodynamic forces going on when, a, when an egret plucks that minnow from that pond. I've watched them for, from sunup to sundown for years, all these, these incredible birds. And it, it makes you realize the real reason man wanted to fly in the first place. We are truly the imitators. They are the real flyers. Well. No matter what else I do, as I said, I'm always going to be that guy. And people always say, well, I guess it doesn't get any better than that. Fighting communism, flying the world's greatest jet. You studly man. You, you are the guy. You did it. And I go, yeah, that's very cool and everything. I, you got to realize I have other priorities in life. They're, that's not the end all. That was one chapter of life. And I'd say that's number two of doesn't get any better than this. If you want my all time doesn't get any better than this moment in life, it would be the day they let me walk down those long concrete steps at Fort Sam Houston and leave the hospital. And there was a blue car waiting for me down, down below. And I walked down those steps with, on my own two legs without somebody helping me. And there was no therapist there to help me. I could open the car door even though it was painful. I didn't want the guy helping me. And I got back in the car and I was getting a second chance to go back to life. 30,000 men never saw the age of 21, died in Vietnam, never got to come home, never had a second chance, never had a life, never had their dreams fulfilled, and I was getting to start over. I was getting to go back and have a second redo. And I, I thought, that doesn't get any better than that. And isn't that all we can, 
we can ask in life is the opportunity. There was no guarantee. When I went back to the Air Force that I'd fly well, I'd get to do it, half of the things I showed you today. No guarantee. All I wanted was the chance, the opportunity. And it's funny how we take our opportunities for granted so much every day. I remember having a squadron commander brief us one day and we were all bitching and moaning about how bad our job was and a trash collector in San Francisco makes more money than a captain on flying status in a squadron. And it was true. Called us all in on a down day and said, okay, here's the deal. New York City, there are 10,000 doctors in one city. 10,000 doctors. He said, there's 4,000 Air Force fighter pilots in the whole world. He said, now, if you don't like your job, you don't want it. There's about a million guys at the door that will take your place. You know, it kind of puts them in perspective. You want to be a trash collector in San Francisco, make that extra $200. Tell me right now, he says, you're out, you're gone. And then the way he said it, we knew he meant it. And it just gave us a moment of perspective that, for me, this was a really great thing to do, but it wasn't the greatest thing. I will tell you, uh, before I close today, I will share this little story with you that uh, people always ask me, was it ever fun to fly the world's fastest jet? And, I, and I've shared this story many, many years ago, and it became, a, it became a cult classic on the Internet. So people send it to me. And I go, hey, I wrote it. It's in my book. I'm the guy. And they go, no, no, I heard this really incredible story. I go, hey, I, it's my story. So I'm going to tell you, because you will see it on the Internet tonight when you, when you go on there called the LA Speed Story. And I, it was just a story about one day it was really cool being, being an SR-71 pilot. Walter and I were doing a training mission around the United States where you just were building up hours and time. And we take off out of Beale, hit a tanker in Idaho, rip on up to uh, Montana, zip across Denver, hang a right turn in Albuquerque, out over Los Angeles, up to Seattle, back into Sacramento, two hours, 21 minutes. And you just do that for, and then you do it backwards, and you hit a tank or two. It was just, just to gain crew coordination, get, build your hours. We're on our last training mission. We're over Tucson. I can see downtown LA from Tucson. We're at 89,000 feet. I can see the whole western United States bathed in a warm October fall glow. I can see the chain of Rocky Mountains from Canada to New Mexico. I could, I could just see the most beautiful picture laid at my feet in this air as smooth as glass. Not a gauge moving in the cockpit. It was perfect. Now I'm thinking, we bad. <laughs> and I feel sorry for Walter because he has to monitor five radios in the back seat. So I flipped the switch up just to listen. and. LA Center is controlling, they control all, when you fly Southwest Air, they're the guys controlling everybody. But we're above controlled airspace. So they, they have us on their scope, but they're not talking to us. Now there's controllers all over the country, Jacksonville Center, Chicago Center, Seattle Center, you know. It's the same guy. They all talk the same. And it's really cool the way they talk, because they make you feel important as a pilot. They don't just say, yeah, okay, here's your thing. They make you feel really cool. So sure enough, this was pre-GPS day. Some Cessna guy has to know his ground speed. Uh, LA Center Cessna November Tango Alpha, you got a ground speed readout for us? Now Center would like to say, who cares, get off free. <laughs> but no, he'll talk to him like he's John Glenn. Cessna November Alpha, we show you 90 knots, nine zero knots on the ground. And they do that sing song, but that's how they talk. And it makes you feel kind of cool. Right after that, a twin bonanza came up to pimp the guy for speed, I guess. And, LA Center, Twin Beach, uh, whatever. You got a ground speed readout for us? And Center likes it. God, it's Friday. Why me? God, please, just get off. But he's going to talk to him like he's Air Force One. Twin Beach, we show you 121, two zero knots on the ground. And right after that, a Navy F-18 out of Lemoore popped up on frequency. And you knew it was a Navy guy because he talked really slick on the radio. <laughs> Center Dusty 5-2 speed check. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. Dusty 5-2 has a ground speed indicator in that million dollar F-18 cockpit. It's right there in the heads up display. Why is he calling Center to broadcast his speed? <laughs> uh, I get it. We have just the meanest, baddest, fastest military jet in the valley today. We're taking our little Hornet jet over Mount Whitney and ripping across Death Valley. And we want everyone from Fresno to the coast to know what real speed is. And you can almost hear a little, a little glee in the controller's voice like, we have put an end to this. 
Testify to, we show you 620, 620 knots across the ground. And it was that across the ground. See that little knife like, I hope nobody else has the nerve to get on frequency now. And there wasn't an airliner from Seattle to San Diego that wanted to be next on freak. It's sort of an etiquette thing amongst flyers. And a 12-year-old was reaching for the mic button. <laughs> And I thought, oh, no, wait, Walter's in charge of the radios. I flew single seat all those years, but I'm in the family model now. And I, I went, no, it's the Navy. They must die. They must die now. And I, and I thought, no, but if I do, I, well, I'll upset Walter, and I want us to be a good crew. And I, at that moment, I heard a click of the mic button in the back seat. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Walter and I became a crew at that moment. And his best innocent voice L.A. Center, Aspen 30. Have you got a ground speed readout for us? <laughs> you could almost hear a collective gasp on Freak, like, oh, the poor fools didn't hear the previous transmissions. Oh, they, they got crushed like a grape. It's, it's just a pilot thing. But Center had to give you that same voice. Aspen 30, we show you 1,992 knots <laughs> across the ground. When I knew I was going to like Walter a lot is when he came back and said, Senator, we're showing a little closer to 2,000. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we did not hear another transmission on that frequency <laughs> all the way to the coast. The king of speed lived, the Navy had been flamed, and a crew had been formed. <laughs> For just a moment, it was absolutely fun being the fastest guys on the block. So what do combat hardened commie fighting fighter pilots do when they retire? I shoot pansies now, and uh, <laughs> I'm very proud of that. I'm opening a gallery in Marysville of my nature photography and my jet stuff. Now there's an eclectic mix. So our motto is, are you ready for this? From butterflies to blackbirds, okay? So yeah, it's pretty good. Only took us two years to come up with that. <laughs> Another two years and we finally developed a, a logo. Um, <laughs> Which we think is pretty cool. That's pretty cool. And we're out, Gallery One has been in the works for 10 years now. We're not quite done, but we've renovated an old 100-year-old building up there. And everybody will know when it's done because we'll put it in the paper. I'm going to close with a little special treat here for you today since I have this incredible, uh, nice audiovisual setup here. One, I'd like to say before I show you this little film, Many of you get what I'm saying today. Make the most of each day. Don't miss your opportunity. Life is short. God, live it. Pursue your passion. Don't wait. You, you get it. And you're going to come up against a situation where you don't see a way around it, over it, through it. But you need, know you need to get to the other side, and you cannot see a way around You don't even understand why it's happening. When you meet that obstacle, just remember this little story. That one day, an SR-71 at Kadena Air Base took the runway out of taxiway alpha there, Rolled down the runway, sat there for 30 seconds, waiting for its appointed takeoff time. As it sat there, just dripping and oozing all the pilot. That day, could look out his little window on a 153 degree heading for 2.6 miles. He could see the roof of the hospital he'd laid in 12 years earlier. Legend has it that on takeoff that day, SR-71, instead of climbing straight out to the South China Sea to hit the tanker, made a hard 90 left turn at the end of the runway full burner, 250 feet. Some say much lower. <laughs> Buzzed a certain soccer field, sending kids screaming and falling down and crying and throwing the ball, and <laughs> running for their life. Rattled every window in a certain hospital without breaking one. And as that big black jet made an arc back to course now that the entire base was awake, it was as if all things had come full circle for that pilot that day. For the first time you could realize some of the reasons and understand better the events that had transpired in his life that he could not possibly fathom while they were happening. He realized at that moment that when Einstein said imagination is more important than knowledge that it was indeed true and that the sky uh, was truly not the limit. So for all of you that said you knew the words I'd like to conclude with a little special treat for you.
that I heard of once in a Final flight, the SR-71 flew from Palmdale, California to the Smithsonian Museum in 64 minutes, setting eight official speed records before they put the jet to bed. I want to thank you for allowing me to come and share a little bit of this ancient technology with folks who are working on cutting edge. I'd like to thank my audiovisual crew. That was excellent. I'd like to thank Melissa for inviting me. To come, I'd like to thank my mom and dad for supporting every dream their wild kid ever had. Don't miss the moment. Joy every day. I will sit at my table as long as uh, any of you like have questions or like to see the book or a coin. We're supporting Wounded Warrior today. It's a treat for me to be in this prestigious facility. I, I've toured about every one of the other top secret places, and this is one of the last uh, few. So you, I didn't know what to expect. It's just been a terrific audience. I gave you a little extra day. You had a few extra stories. I'm sorry if I cut into your, 
your lunch. I'm sure the food here is just spectacular. <laughs> Um, so I'll let you get back to your important work, and, and, uh, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you.